Welcome to Heartwood Church Online. We're glad that you chose to connect with us virtually and hope that in the future you'll connect with the people of Heartwood either through other virtual events or in person. The ministry of Heartwood Church can be summarized in two words, life and strength. A life grows stronger when a person faithfully connects to Jesus, the source of life. And Heartwood Church helps people make and grow that connection in deep and practical ways. To engage with us today, you can leave a comment on the video, fill out the connection card at heartwood.church slash contact us, or text us at 651-321-321. 3204. We pray today's worship brings us all life and strength. Our scripture reading is Mark 2, 2 through 9. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves to be alone. He was transfigured in front of them and his clothes became dazzling, extremely white, as no launderer on earth could whiten them. Elijah appeared to them with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us set up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, because he did not know what to say, since they were terrified. A cloud appeared overshadowing them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Let's pray. Lord, today, as we gather as your church to worship you and see you for who you are, we pray that you be revealed to us in a way that we haven't seen before, that we will see your glory and not be terrified, but be drawn to you and be strengthened by your spirit this day. And we ask this in the name of Jesus, our glorious Savior. Amen. My Lord, my Lord.
My family moved from California to Minnesota, we considered that there would be cultural differences between the West Coast and the upper Midwest of the United States. While my wife and I would have to adapt, our children would not really know California culture. Some people might say that's a good thing. Regardless, we still didn't have to change things like our language. Other than dressing warmer, we really didn't have to change how we dress. In order for us to go and make disciples, our children would still, <clears throat> excuse me, still culturally be United States Americans. My moving is nothing compared to some of our missionaries who are, some of whom are raising their families and one of them even multiple generations of their families in other cultures with other languages, places where they are the minority ethnicity, all to go make disciples to bring people into God's family and build the kingdom of God. Last week, we looked at the tools God provides, the Holy Spirit, time, and places. Today, we're going to look at using those tools to build. Let's read Acts 8, 26 through 38, the story of Philip and the Ethiopian, our symbol at Heartwood Church of how we want to grow as a church. Acts 8, 26 through 38. An angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, Get up and go south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is the desert road. So he got up and went. There was an Ethiopian man, a eunuch, and high official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to worship in Jerusalem and was sitting in his chariot on his way home, reading the prophet Isaiah aloud. The spirit told Philip, Go and join that chariot. When Philip ran up to it, he heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you are reading? How can I, he said, unless someone guides me? So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the scripture passage he was reading was this. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb is silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who will describe his generation? for his life is taken from the earth. The eunuch said to Philip, I ask you, who is the prophet saying this about, himself or someone else? Philip proceeded to tell him the good news about Jesus, beginning with that scripture. As they were traveling down the road, they came to some water. The eunuch said, look, there is water. What would keep me from being baptized? Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he replied, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he ordered the chariot to stop, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. The first thing I must do to build the kingdom of God is build relationships. Philip began as a leader in the church at Jerusalem. Persecution moved him to Samaria, where he made disciples. From there, he's moved by the Holy Spirit. The one of who we saw last week is the power source for disciple-making. Philip moves south to the road that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. This means he's gone through Jerusalem, and instead of meeting up with his old friends and rejoining his former ministry in Jerusalem, he goes on to meet someone new. On this southern road, 
is a rich Ethiopian man riding in a chariot, reading scripture aloud. The Holy Spirit prompts Philip a second time, this time to go and join that chariot. This would be like me walking on Summit Avenue in St. Paul, seeing a limousine drive by and the Holy Spirit saying to me, hey, go get in that limo. Philip is not looking for a ride. He's looking for a person. He approaches the chariot and begins a conversation. He doesn't say, hi, I'd like to tell you about Jesus. He also doesn't say, hi, my name is Philip and I'd like to tell you about myself. Philip began a conversation about something the Ethiopian was interested in. Hi, I see you're reading a book. I've also read that book. What do you think? That's how to build a relationship. Show interest in the thing that the other person is interested in. It turns out that this Ethiopian would love to have a conversation about what he's reading because he doesn't completely understand it. He might recognize Philip as a Jew. And if he did, he would welcome his insight because Philip would have been taught this scripture since he was a child. Philip's next step in relationship building is waiting to get invited deeper. He doesn't just jump into the chariot, but he does get in once the Ethiopian invites him. Even for friendly people, building relationships is not always easy. As we move from childhood to early adulthood, our relationships naturally expand. We're going to school, moving into our careers, getting married, having children. All these things expand our network. As we get older, our networks naturally decrease. Perhaps we can't get out as much. Our network becomes our, primarily our family as we gain get grandchildren and maybe our friends start to die. Perhaps we retire so we don't see our coworkers anymore. Maybe we move out of our neighborhood and into an assisted living that's more like a closed community where new people only come in after someone else leaves because they die. Perhaps the one consistent community I may have is church and pastor doesn't sing the same old songs and wants us to invite new people and young people to our church. You know, adding on to life stage changes, in February 2021, we are nearing a year of global pandemic where we intentionally don't go out and spend time meeting new people. We don't even spend time with the people that we used to see regularly. On February 1st, the Oakdale Nature Center reopened to the public. And just this last week, I went there and had lunch with the staff there. I told Laura, who works at the front desk, before the pandemic, when I was out running, I would see you at least you know, five days a week and say hi. And now I haven't seen you in five months. How do I build a relationship like that, let alone make disciples? It's important that we see the order of events between Philip and the Ethiopian. At least in this case, relationships are made before disciples are made. And I think elsewhere in the book of Acts, and even today, that's shown to be the more effective way of guiding someone towards faith in Jesus. Relationships is why I'm more effective at witnessing to my friends than you might be. And you are more effective at witnessing to your friends than I would be. If I say to a stranger, let me tell you about Jesus, they could rightly question, why do I want to tell them about Jesus? If you say to your friend, let me take you to my pastor so he can tell you about Jesus, your friend could rightly say, why take me to your pastor? Don't you know Jesus? Relationships build credibility, and credibility combined with the power of the Holy Spirit builds the kingdom of God. And that's what disciples do. Disciples build the kingdom of God. The first thing I must do is build relationships. The second thing I must do to build the kingdom of God is build bridges. Philip and the Ethiopian are not natural friends. They grew up in different cultures and different countries. They have a common language they can speak, but their native languages are different. They are at different socioeconomic and political levels. They have different educations. There is space between them that needs to be 
bridged. Even our writer of this passage, Luke, is trying to bridge these spaces. In verse 27, Luke says, The Ethiopian is a high official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. I don't know if Luke's understanding is lacking or if he's trying to explain and bridge this cultural gap for his reader. By saying Candace, queen, Luke is using Candace almost like a personal name, which it's not. Candace, like Pharaoh, is the title or position of the queen of Ethiopia. The Ethiopian works for the Candace. But there is such a cultural gap here that most people wouldn't know that a Candace is a queen. Can you imagine the possible offense if Philip were to say, so you work for Candace? Is she someone important where you come from? There are also potential walls between Philip and the Ethiopian. The Ethiopian had been to Jerusalem to worship, but because he's a Gentile and a eunuch, he couldn't get past the court of the Gentiles. He probably couldn't see much or learn much from there. Philip could go all the way through the court of the Gentiles, through the court of the women, and into the court of the men, where the priests actually made sacrifices on the altar. Philip could have also offended the Ethiopian by how he responded to the Ethiopian's questions. The Ethiopian humbly admits that he doesn't completely understand what he's reading and that he needs a teacher. Philip doesn't say, what are you, stupid? I learned this stuff as a child. The Ethiopian is not dumb. He's the treasurer of a country. He can do accounting and he can read in languages that are not even his native languages. He could have been reading those scriptures in Greek or in Hebrew. And he understands 99% of what he's reading. All he wants to know is, who is he reading about? Because that information is not explicit in the text. Philip also could have gotten offended that this Ethiopian actually had a copy of an Isaiah scroll. There was no Lifeway store or Amazon at this time to go buy a Bible. Scriptures were sacred and kept in the synagogues. Used copies were stored away out of reach. That's how we got the Dead Sea Scrolls today. The Ethiopian probably paid for on the black market or was gifted an Isaiah scroll. And he would have no idea that having this text outside a synagogue might offend Philip. Because otherwise he wouldn't have been out on the open road with the scroll reading it aloud. He shouldn't have had the scroll. But Philip doesn't even bring it up. He chooses not to be offended. To build the bridge, Philip focuses on what they have in common. They were traveling the same road from Jerusalem to Gaza. They could speak a common language, most likely Greek. They both worshipped the God of Jerusalem. And they both read the scriptures. Sometimes we Christians focus too much on our differences and not just our differences with unbelievers, but also our differences with each other. I was discussing multi-ethnic ministry with another pastor, and this pastor shared a story about missionaries he knew that were working in Africa. They were working with two tribes, forgive me if I mispronounce them, the Chitonga and the Nyang. As people um, from these two tribes came to faith in Jesus, the missionaries tried to get them to worship together. These tribes weren't at war or anything like that, but they just felt more comfortable or at ease, more natural, is what he told me, worshiping separately. The pastor went on to say the missionaries had to learn that there was nothing in the Bible that said the two tribes could not worship separately from each other. Everyone was much happier. Now, there are so many things that I disagree with in that last statement. First, Jesus even said in Matthew 19, 8, that there are things that God is not pleased with, such as divorce, which God allows under certain circumstances because of the hardness of human hearts. I think disunity and segregation in worship could certainly be categorized in that hardness of heart area. Secondly, worship isn't supposed to make me happy. It's supposed to make God happy. The story does end better than it begins. Eventually, the two tribes did come together to form one congregation, despite the weak doctrine they were taught. Just as God seeks unity in the church, that's part of the symbolism of baptism that we discussed last week. 
when making disciples, I need to realize the person I may naturally choose to be friends with may not be the only person God wants me to build a relationship with. I mean, I'm an introvert. My natural friendship circle is small. Not many people share the unique parts of my life experience. And all that's okay. But a follower of Jesus is not self-interested. I can have few friends, but if I'm going to make disciples, I can't be exclusive. If I'm going to build God's kingdom, I shouldn't be easily offended. When I'm moved by the Holy Spirit, I need to find common ground with other people. That's how disciples build the kingdom of God. The first thing I must do is build relationships. The second thing I must do to build the kingdom of God is build bridges. And the third thing I must do is build disciples. Maybe you've heard this from a pastor or evangelist. If you died tonight, are you sure of what would happen to you after? Perhaps that's not always the best way to go about sharing Jesus. Philip doesn't ask questions. He answers them. Philip wants to know, or excuse me, the Ethiopian wants to know who Isaiah is talking about. So Philip tells him that it's Jesus. Then Philip explains to the Ethiopian all about Jesus, beginning with that very Isaiah scripture. By the time Philip is done explaining, the Ethiopian understands enough to want to become a Christian. He sees some water and is ready to be baptized. I'll mention here, we have a textual variant in the Bible. Some Bible translations may have verse 37 italicized or down in the footnotes because it's not contained in all the ancient manuscripts. For me, even though verse 37 may not be original, it is, its message is consistent with the rest of Acts, that one believes and then is baptized. But Philip doesn't say, let's go back to Jerusalem and talk to Peter. Peter's likely in Samaria anyway, still doing follow-up from uh, Philip's first mission. Philip baptizes the Ethiopian, bringing him into the one family of God's people. Now, there was probably no other way to baptize him, but notice the text says, they both went down into the water. I think that's there to show unity. When Philip baptizes uh, Simon in Samaria, Luke doesn't say that they both went into the water. When Saul is baptized by Ananias, Luke doesn't say that Saul and, An and Ananias both went down into the water. When the household of Cornelius is baptized, Luke doesn't say that Peter went down into the water with them. In Philippi, when Paul and Silas baptized Lydia and the jailer, Luke doesn't say that they all went down into the water. When Crispus, the leader of the synagogue of Corinth, is baptized, Luke doesn't say that Paul went down into the water with him. When Paul baptizes Apollos in Ephesus, Luke doesn't say that they both went down into the water. But Philip and the Ethiopian go into the water together. These two men, who were unequal in so many ways, are now united with one Lord, one faith, one baptism. They are together as Philip completed the command of Jesus to go, baptize, and teach. Philip is a disciple who made another disciple and built the kingdom of God. My daughter and I are doing a Bible reading plan together on the YouVersion Bible app. Doing that plan together... There's space at the end of each reading for us to write something that stood out to us from the reading. She asked me one day, how come I can't see what you wrote? I had read that morning and wrote a comment, so I went back and looked at the day's readings. All the check marks that showed that I had done my reading were there, but my comment wasn't there anymore. I had read and wrote, but I realized I never hit the submit button. It's the same way with making disciples. I have to finish the deal. Matthew 28, 18 through 20 does not say, go and make friends in all nations. It says, go and make disciples. With every friendship I make, I do have an agenda. There's a reason I build a relationship and bridges. I don't just want someone to come to my church. I don't just want someone to convert to Christianity. 
I build a relationship because I care about them and I want my friends to live. That's what making disciples is about, bringing people into life and family, not merely bringing people to church. Disciples build the kingdom of God, not just their friendship circles, not just their networks, and not just their churches. Disciples build the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is a place of life. And it's built one disciple, one bridge, one relationship, one life at a time. You know, we have missionaries in different places in the world all doing this same thing. They are building relationships and bridges with people. And then, as people show interest, they walk through the scriptures with them. One of the methods many of them use is discovery Bible study. Some of our workers even do discovery Bible study with Muslims. They read the Bible together, figure out what it's saying, and then pick one thing to do in their life based on what they figured out. Next time they get together, they share about what they did since they last met and then start the process over with a new Bible passage. Doing this, people come to faith in Jesus, and they become the witnesses to their own friends and family. You can find out how to lead a Discovery Bible study yourself at the Contagious Disciple Making YouTube channel and podcast, and it'll be linked in the notes. We know the Ethiopian official went home and shared what he had learned, because Ethiopia is most likely the place in the world with the longest continuous Christian communities. When you or I build a relationship, build a bridge, and build a disciple, only God knows how long and how wide that disciple-making chain will multiply and last. Build God's kingdom by making one disciple, who's your one. Our prayer today is from Psalm 50. Our God, the mighty one who is coming to judge his people and gather his faithful ones to himself, those who made a covenant with him by the sacrifice of Jesus, those who call on the Lord in the day of trouble, God will rescue. And those who persist in wickedness and forget God, he will tear apart. There will be no one to rescue them. So God, we ask for the power, the tools, and the will to show others the salvation of God. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. As you reflect on this message, think of one thing that resonated with you, one thing that challenged you, one thing you want to learn more about. Hopefully, maybe that's Discovery Bible Study. And one thing you will do based on what you've heard. And I'll leave you with this blessing this week. May our God who called Abraham when he was but one and blessed him and made him many show you the incomparable riches of his grace so that you might know that you are his workmanship to do good works which God has prepared in advance for us to do. worshiping with us today. Don't forget to reach out through the comments, connection card, or text line. To support Hartwood Church financially, we have secure online giving through Tithely and Venmo. You can download either of these apps or go to heartwood.church/give. Have a blessed